The Celtics were up 30, but wound up losing to the Hawks anyway. Does the loss and March basketball in general really matter? Houston wins their ninth straight, and the plane is in their sights. The Nuggets keep climbing the standings, and the West theirs to lose. Plus, the latest reporting from ESPN on Toronto's John Tay Porter and his ties to gambling. What does it all mean? We answer that and more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to a Tuesday edition of Lockdown NBA, your daily podcast covering all things around the association. However, you may be listening on YouTube, Odyssey, your favorite podcast app. Thank you so much for making Lockdown NBA your first listen every day. I'm David Ramil, the co-host of Locked On Heat, and with me today is Swiper, the co-host of Locked On Nuggets. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to PrizePicks.com. Slash locked on NBA and use the code all lowercase locked on NBA for his first deposit match of up to one hundred dollars. Swipe up first and foremost. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. It's a very, very, very busy NBA day. A lot of news to get to. A lot of really interesting games. The East and West have some really interesting storylines. At the top of the West, uh, there's a battle going on. At the bottom of the West, there's a battle going on to get into the playoffs and into the plan. Uh, the NBA got its wish list. Everything they could have asked for. The play-in is making basketball relevant 1 through 10, and now it looks like 1 through 11 as well. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll get to all of the ongoings from tonight's action, and we'll also talk about the latest reporting from ESPN about a scandal that could have some big-time ramifications for the sport in general. But we'll start the night off in Atlanta, where the Hawks were hosting the Boston Celtics no Drew Holiday, no Derek White in the lineup, and it didn't seem like it mattered for the Celtics as they blew the doors open and climbed to a 30-point lead. But then in the third quarter, things started turning around for the Hawks. They started climbing their way back. They eventually got their first lead of the game with about 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. And from there, it was pretty much back and forth until a DeAndre Hunter three-pointer sealed the deal for Atlanta giving the Hawks a two-point win, 120-118. to 118. The Hawks shot 50% from three-point range. They were incredible. Uh, they got 22 points from Bogdan Bogdanovich. They also got 19 from DeJounte Murray. A good, well-rounded performance all around. But I guess the bigger question is, you know, we're all looking at this. I know Celtics fans are going to make this uh, a bigger deal than it probably should be. But, uh, you know, my co-host, my usual co-host, I should say, Matt Moore and I, kind of have a long-standing debate regarding March basketball and how unimportant it might be because it's just really bad basketball. It's Everybody's got their eye on the bigger prize of the playoffs. And as bad a loss as this is for the Celtics, does it actually really matter in the long run? You know, it's actually a huge deal because now the Celtics, mm -hmm. because of this loss, they're – Grip on the Eastern Conference slips to just a 10-and-a-half game lead for first yeah. place. Right so. There. Right. You know, it's it means nothing in that it doesn't affect them overall for the course of the season. I think the thing about the Celtics, so if we're being honest, David, is a lot of this is narrative about the Celtics. They're one of the best teams performance wise over the last several seasons in the regular season. They're one of the best teams from net rating standpoint ever in modern NBA history, especially. And so I think a lot of people are looking at this team and saying everything comes down to the NBA finals for the late game execution. Tatum, is he going to be able to make his shot? Jalen Brown, is he be a suitable number two, largest contract in NBA history? They make the trade for Drew Holiday and Christoph Porzingis. Hey, Joe Mazzula, did you fix the rotation issues that you had last year going into the playoffs? Those are the questions that surround the Boston Celtics. And so for me, if you ask me, they lost to the Hawks with no Trey Young. And DeJounte Murray had 19 points and 15 assists, and they were down 30 points in the third quarter. And even yet, the Boston Celtics were able to pull out this L, despite the fact that they were just continuing to just run through the game. So for me, it doesn't mean much of anything. You know, last year, the NBA champions went 16 and four in the playoffs. They went about eight and 10 the last 18 games of the year. And in March, they had a seven game lead for first place, and they absolutely let their foot off the gas. I think this is the point in the season where teams are still fine-tuning their process. Or if you have this kind of lead over the conference, really there's no incentive 
for you to play well. What, we need to win 65, 67 games instead of 63? Really, that's really the question that it comes down to. Maybe you're fighting for another All-NBA award if you're an individual player or an MVP, Coach of the Year, Most Improved Player, Sixth Man of the Year, one of those kind of individual awards. But from a team standpoint, we've done our job. Through 72 games, we've been the best team in the NBA. We want to make sure we secure our record. We're healthy. And look, when the playoffs start, we're going to give everybody a full week off, and that way they can lock into the first round, whoever they're playing in the play-in uh, out the Eastern Conference. So for me, this doesn't mean much of anything. This is a good win for the Atlanta Hawks. DeAndre Hunter hits a nice three-pointer to put the game away. And I think DeJounte Murray and everybody else just kind of putting their best foot forward as they try to make their playoffs and scrape into the playoffs. So I think for this, the Celtics, it doesn't mean anything. I think Celtics fans should just take this in step. Do you have questions about the Celtics? Obviously, as you mentioned, the playoffs are ultimately the barometer for how you measure this team. Somebody who covers the Heat, you know, I think a lot of Heat fans expect that the team could probably contend. You've obviously got the Milwaukee Bucks. You have questions about the Philadelphia 76ers and the return of Joel Embiid. But while the Celtics look like the, the clear favorites in the East, do you still have lingering questions about their ability to contend? Uh, I think contend is not the word for me. I think to get the job done, that would be the phrase that I more so stick with. Do they have the personnel? Sure. But do they have the execution? Do they have the play mm -hmm. style? Do they have the belief in their system? Here's the thing. You know, David, you, me and I have never talked about Miami Heat basketball before. I'm a big Heat fan. I'm a big Jimmy Butler fan. Okay. I'm a big Spo fan. I'm a big Bam Adebayo fan. I think that they have one of the best cultures in the NBA. I love the way they play. I love the way they communicate. And they don't beat themselves. That's the thing about the Heat. That's why they always give teams trouble. They will not beat themselves. You better put them away. The Celtics, they don't put people away historically. Now, this is a new team. Yeah. I want to be fair to Celtics fan. Because the first thing they're going to bring up, David, you bring that up. Well, we didn't have Christoph and Drew Holiday. It was Joe's first year last year. Tatum's a different player. Right. And again, I want to agree with that. You're This is a different team. But is the core different? Is the mind, mindset different when it matters the most? And that, for me, is the question that I have. Are they going to be able to win? It gets to the first round. Are they going to go ahead and take it to six with Trey Young just because they didn't have to get it done earlier? Are they going to take the Philadelphia 76ers to go down 3-2 or whoever they're playing in the second round and then have to Jason Tate a master class in the fourth and then 51 points in a game seven, putting Joe Owen Meade on skates? Or they get into a game seven with the Miami Heat. And Jason Tatum, like, well, if Jason Tatum didn't, tear, didn't you know, roll his ankle, then they might have won that game. Well, that's why you don't get down 0-3. That's the way it works. That's the NBA. That's why <laughs> nobody's come back from 0-3 before and won the series. So I think for me, this is like, these are things that were done to you and you did to yourself. What's going to be different when the three-point shot is not falling? And again, David, I got to tell you this. I am not a three-point lifer. I think that in the regular season, that's perfectly fine. But 47% of your shots are coming from the three-point line in the playoffs. Versus Spo, versus Giannis and them, that seems problematic. So I just want to see them do it. I love Tatum. I think he's a really good player. He's one of the best sure. young players in the league. But man, uh, this is this is nuck if you buck time. You know, we in Atlanta. This is nuck if you buck time. This is time for you to show up, get the job done, get a win, and see if they can win the NBA Finals this year. What about, what about you? You're a Miami Heat. You cover the team. You I you do. watch the team. You're locked in. What do you think about the Celtics right now? I. I mean, I think they're dangerous, obviously. Uh, but as you pointed out, I, I still think it comes down to execution and overall temperament. And the Heat yeah. just don't seem like a team that really fears anybody, for better or for worse. Uh, you know, probably the, the team that they're most concerned with, and with good reason, is the Denver Nuggets, the one team that they weren't able to beat. And I've made this right. point on the show before. When it comes to the Eastern Conference, they look around, they beat the Bucks, they beat the Celtics, right. they beat everybody in the Eastern Conference. They beat the Knicks last year, although I think the Knicks are a very dangerous team that not enough people are talking about. So I, I still like Miami's chances of being able to advance, but right now they've just struggled so much with injury and they are kind of missing a bigger picture identity because, you know, they've got their culture and everything else. That's the foundation. But as far as the season is concerned, there are legitimate questions about whether or not Tyler Hero comes back. What can Duncan yeah. Robinson do? He's dealing with injury right now. So there's a lot of questions. But, you know, let's let's move on a little bit because there are other games to get to. When you talk about finding an identity, a team that's still looking for theirs, even with 70 games under their belt, the Phoenix Suns, they yeah. drop a game 102 to 104 to San Antonio Spurs. Jeremy Sohan with a three pointer at the buzzer to seal the deal for San Antonio. Is this a concerning loss for the Phoenix Suns, too? Because, uh, you know, obviously with Boston, 
they've got the you know, Eastern Conference in the stranglehold. Phoenix very much still trying to find their way. And, and you know, right now they're still a play-in team at the eighth seed currently. Are you looking at this Phoenix Suns team and concerned? Because my point has always been you've got those three players. You've got a good enough cast of characters surrounding them, the role players that find a way to step up inconsistently at best. Bradley Beal struggled tonight. Uh, Devin Booker had a big night. Kevin Durant, obviously, he had a good night as well, but still find a way to lose. When you look at the Suns team, what's your biggest question about them moving forward? Ooh, I don't know. You can't measure hard on paper, but they don't handle pressure well. They have not historically handled pressure well. And then in the fourth quarter, they've also not been a great team this year. And Kevin Durant, as good as he'd been, I think Kevin Durant has an argument for first team all NBA over Jason Tatum this year. I think he's been yeah. that good this year. So does LeBron, to be fair. Um, but I think the issue is yeah. Devin Booker at 36, 6, and 4 tonight. Kevin Durant had 29, yep. 8, and 6. Bradley Bill, 9, 5, and 6. Now, didn't play super well. But Man. the issue is, you got a pretty good game. I mean, Nurkic obviously went out uh, with a little bit of injury. He only played 19 minutes and 20 seconds today. But yeah. they're in a situation, man, where they just don't seem, David, to have the requisite fight that you need yeah. from a championship team or a contending team. And I know, like, we're always talking about, well, when they get on the court healthy, when they get on the court healthy, well, that's a little problematic that yeah. we're 70 games into the year and we're still – Asking this question, how many games will they be healthy? But you understand this more than a lot of people. Is continuity means everything in winning in the playoffs. And if you don't have an identity and you're not bought into what player A, player B, player C is exactly supposed to be doing on the court, and I know where I fit in in all of that, that puts yeah. you in a real problematic situation when you're playing versus team that have been forming themselves all year. The Thunder, the Timberwolves, the Nuggets, they know who they are. Like, they're locked in. They know exactly what they're going to do. They know exactly how to get there. And I think the Suns, right now, they are playing on the razor's edge. Because the Western Conference is no joke. The Mavs are sitting at the seventh seed. They're a half game up. The Suns are currently at the eighth seed. And then on top of that, yeah. you got the Kings, who are at the at the sixth seed right now. But the Lakers, they're two and a half games back. And then the Warriors, they're five games back. So that's cooked. But the Kings, the Mavericks, and the Suns, if I'm one of them, I am doing everything I can to get out that play in uh, because you get in that area, it's going to be really, really tough to get out. And a team that we haven't talked about nearly enough, we'll get to them in the next segment as the Houston Rockets continue to win big. They're ninth straight tonight. We'll get yeah. to that and much more around the NBA next on Locked On NBA. Today's show is brought to you by our good friends over at Price Picks. What's Price Picks? Well, it's America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. Why aren't you one of them? We are the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Why? Because it's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than the projections on two to six players, and you just watch the winnings roll in, and it's so easy and simple to play. You can make your picks and submit an entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. And right now, if you go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown NBA and use the code lockdown NBA, you get a first deposit match of up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash lockdown NBA. Don't forget to use that code lockdown NBA and you get a first deposit match of up to $100. Prizepicks.com. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. We'll be right back on Locked On NBA. We're back here on Locked On NBA. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Well, if you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting, make the switch over to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories Without all the screaming, Locked On Sports brings you you-can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm David Ramil, the host of Locked On Heat, and with me is Swiper, the co-host of Locked On Nuggets. We're going to get to some of the action around the NBA before we start talking about the latest news out of Toronto, where a player might be involved in a major issue that could have long-term and big-time ramifications for the sport in general. But first, let's talk about the Houston Rockets because they were in Portland tonight. Actually, they were hosting Portland tonight, and they were down early. And I'm thinking to myself, well, here you go. Here's a another loss for a Rockets team that uh, just you know might not have that same kind of foundation and identity that we were just talking about in the first segment. They've won eight straight before tonight, but they were having some struggles. Fred Van Vliet was in 
foul trouble early. Uh, uh, Jalen Green was struggling from the floor. He wound up shooting 9 of 26 overall, but they got the job done. Maybe it's just because it's the Blazers falling apart, but eventually the Rockets came back, led by Jock Landale. He wound up having a big night, 17 points, 6 of 6 from the floor, really carried him, and, and of course, Green did chip in 27 points, albeit somewhat inefficiently. You're looking at the Houston Rockets, and what's your take on them? Because now they've won nine straight. They're, as you pointed out earlier, they're on their way, climbing up the standings. They could bump out the Lakers. They could bump out the Warriors. They could bump out any of these teams that are right now. In the, they could even bump out the Suns with all their star power and everything else. You might wind up seeing the Rockets in the play-in tournament and wind up maybe facing your Denver Nuggets in the first round of the playoffs. That could be a really exciting matchup for a, a team that is still really kind of trying to find their themselves this season. When you look at the Rockets, are you buying this win streak and their legitimacy as a playoff team? Yeah, you know, first off, I want to give credence to them. They're 11 and 1 in their last 12 games. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's nothing no, to sneeze at. At this point of the season, especially without right. Alfred Sengun, too. Like he's out right. of the lineup, he's been hurt. He's coming back at some point, but right now they're playing without arguably one of their best players. Yeah, and then obviously Jalen Green has taken this leap. He's ascending before our very eyes. And this is someone that for the last several years, you know, people were really down on. They just didn't think that he made it the right stuff. Are, are you? Are, is this a dig at me? Because if you're a longtime <laughs> listener of the show, I made some comments a year and a half ago that were not that incendiary at all. And uh, yeah, he has taken a leap. But I give him credit for that because he, I think he's he's turned things around to a certain degree. But just a couple months ago, even Rockets fans, and I'll point that out pretty gladly, were saying this is not Jalen Green's team. He is not an NBA player, et cetera. So I felt somewhat vindicated, although I did not feel proud of uh, of them trashing a player like that. I don't think I said anything bad about it. But yes, to your point, Green has played well of late, and he's scoring. He's taking on the scoring front. He's getting a lot of contributions from guys around the team as well. But but he has been the straw that stirs the drink. Yeah, and I think he deserves credit for that. I think whenever you're a young player – you know, he has some personal things that are happening. And so I think there are some things, some motivation he might have. But I think, too, as a career, hey, you know, I'm trying to get that next contract and I want to make sure I'm a winning mm -hmm. player on this team. And he's doing everything that he needs to do to get that. So obviously, congratulations to him for the work he's put in uh, to get to this point. But and again, I'll be fair. I acknowledge they are also 11 and one in the last 12. But if you look at who they played, they beat the mm -hmm. Spurs, you know, Evan Mobley did not play, or not the Spurs. They they beat the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, Evan did not play in that game, yep. but they beat the Trailblazers, the Jazz, the Bulls, the Wizards, the Wizards, the Spurs. They did beat the Kings. They beat the Blazers before. They beat the Spurs, and then they did beat the Suns. So there is a mixed bag. They're not playing versus very good competition, but you know what? They're taking care of their business. That's what matters. And when you're a young team, Ime Udoka deserves so much credit for helping to establish a culture around defense and playing together and playing to your skill sets. And I think Jeff Green, Fred Van Fleet, Jock Landale, obviously at this point in time in the season, they have all been valuable contributors to this team as veterans that are helping them to shape their identity. And obviously with no Alperin Shingun, who, again, you know, he was teetering on an all-star level year for a lot of people. And so I think for him to be out of the lineup and for them to have responded this well is huge. And I think this bodes well, not just for the short term, but also for their long-term future with Amen Thompson, Jabari Smith Jr., Jalen Green, when Shingun comes back, Cam Whitmore. They got a lot of dogs on that roster and a lot of guys that I think they want to learn how to play basketball the right way, the X's and O's and playing together and playing for each other. So this is a good moment for them because this is how a lot of these championship cores, they develop. They have to have little runs like this. They're like, you know what? We actually can do this at a high level. So let's keep pressing and let's see if we can make the playoff. Maybe we can give LeBron James and Anthony Davis a run for their money or Steph Curry a run for his money or maybe Luka Doncic and Kevin Durant. So I think that I don't believe this is something that's going to mean much in terms of this mm. season and what's going to happen for them. But I think for their culture and their core, this is a huge moment for them. This is the most successful they've ever been. Yeah, I, I like that point because, uh, you know, we've seen this with a lot of teams throughout NBA history is that, you know, they want to make this push, but it's not about the short term. Uh, it's not about just making the playoffs and then kind of resting on your laurels. You want to continue to build something, start off. And, yeah, it's nice to get that kind of prize for all the work that you put in this season. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to define this team. It's what, what, how they respond next year. How can they continue building on that? Do they make other roster moves to continue to complement the players currently on the team? Because, yes, they have a good core, but you might say they're missing a piece or two. 
And if so, do they add those pieces over the offseason? Like you next look at the next four games. Like it's not an easy path for them. They take on the Oklahoma City Thunder, then they take on the Jazz at, on the road, which is not an easy place to win. Then you come back home against the Dallas Mavericks that have been playing well of late. And then you go to Minnesota for a, a matchup against the Timberwolves. Not an easy stretch for any team, certainly not for a team that has been winning as much as Houston, as you pointed out, beating up on bad teams, but that's what you're supposed to do. So it's a good start, but it might not necessarily be all about the finish when it comes to this particular iteration of the team. But when you're looking at a team that is looking to finish strong, well, it's the Denver Nuggets who got yet another win. What is this? Their fourth straight tonight? Uh, you know, uh, you did you you were covering the game, obviously, but you did watch it. What were your takeaways from the 120, uh, 28 win over the Memphis Grizzlies who only managed 103 points. Obviously, the Grizzlies still beat up. Not quite the team uh, that a lot of people expected them to be this yeah. season. But you look at the Nuggets. They're just – they just have been so good. Like, I, I'm at a point now where I think the Nuggets are not necessarily unbeatable, but they're clearly the top of the top. Like, I don't have questions when it comes to the Nuggets. Whether they, they lose a the game, it doesn't matter. When they win it, they continue to just do things the right way. They continue to build on those good habits. They're continuing to get – Better. And they get an all-around effort tonight. Michael Malone really effusive in his pay- praise of the whole team afterwards. For, you know, talking about guys playing defense at a high level, getting key contributions from guys like Peyton Watson and others. You know, it was just yeah. it's a good win for a team that just continues to win at a high level. When you look at Denver and you look at the rest of the Western Conference, are they a lock to move on to the NBA Finals at this point? In your opinion, I don't think anybody's a lock. You know, I always want to be respectful of the of how the NBA works. You, you've been a part of the league for a long uh, time. I feel like it's it, right there on the surface. I know, I, I know you're saying the right things, but I feel like you want to just go <laughs> all in and just say no. Nah, it's, it's clearly Denver. No, nah, you know, I think if you ask me, are they the favorite? I would say yes. I think that you know, I think the Thunder, yeah. the Timberwolves, the Clippers. I think all of them offer unique challenges, and I think that's a challenge you have to respond to. But I think that's what the Nuggets, what makes them so special, though. They don't take anyone lightly. They yeah. they appreciate the game, yeah. and I think you know the Nuggets are fifteen and two since the All Star break. I mean, they have absolutely just like turned it up a notch and said, all right, you know, they lost three straight games. They lost to the Kings. They lost to the Bucks. And they- Lost to the Kings three straight games to close out the All Star break, and ever since that point, they came back. They're just like, look, in order to win a championship, we need to be fine tuned into what we're supposed to do. And uh, what I love about the Nuggets is, it's not about winning and losing for them. They believe the outcome of playing basketball the right way is winning. And if yeah. we lose playing the right way, then we know we did what we were supposed to do, and they just beat us that day. And I think similar to the Miami Heat, as you're obviously aware of, they won't put themselves in position for you to beat them. And so for them, it's like, yeah. how do we get to where we need to be? You know, Jokic right now, he's looking like he's going to cruise his way to a third MVP in the last four years, which is obviously insane. Yeah. I mean, obviously, just, you know, we haven't seen that since LeBron. And then before that, we haven't seen that since right. Michael Jordan. So, you know, this is just a yeah. different era of basketball we've gotten into. Um, but I think Jamal, you know, they're resting him, being a little, you know, careful with him. He rolled his ankle against the Knicks the other day. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., by the way, he's been on an absolute tear since he came back from the all-star break as well, just firing on all cylinders. I, you know, they, the heat hosted them just a couple of weeks ago. And I, I just was so impressed with everything that the players had to say uh, about, and not just the players, but Michael Malone. And then you kind of just get a glimpse into how they viewed this season and that last year and their championship for all the success they achieved was just like the first step, just continuing to build and maintain. Like it's clear as opposed to some other teams in the past that have won a championship that maybe it's not necessarily a clear idea of this is just the beginning. We want to continue to build off those championship habits. We want to continue to get better. Like repeating as a champion is obviously very difficult, but the mindset of these nuggets and they've had it all season long is just, it's incredible to see it in in person and just to hear these players talk about how the belief system among these players is so strong. So I am absolutely a believer and I agree with you that they are absolutely a favorite in the Western conference, but they're still, a lot yeah. of basketball left to be played. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic playoffs. I know everybody is kind of looking forward to it around the league, fans, et cetera. We're all kind of having questions, but there's a lot of fun basketball to be played because a lot of teams still looking to get some seating uh, you know, locked in to fine tune some of those details that we were talking about. But there's also one big issue that's taking place now in Toronto as the NBA has launched an investigation into John Tay Porter and his potential ties to some gambling. We'll talk about that in the next segment here on Locked On NBA. Today's show is brought to you 
by BetterHelp. Look, it's not easy for a lot of people right now. Sometimes you 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 feel like you've got a good support circle, right? You know, you got friends, you got family, you want to talk to them about something that might be eating at you. But the thing about that is that they're always going to get a biased opinion. You you you're going to get somebody that's going to be colored by their perception of you or their association with you, whatever that relationship might be. And that doesn't necessarily help in the long term because you want to continue to to not just have the freedom to talk freely about whatever issues might be bothering you, but just to continue to build and grow as a person. And so you need somebody that's unbiased to be able to get these things off your chest. And that's where therapy comes in. And if you're looking to try therapy, then maybe what you should do is give BetterHelp a try because it is so convenient. You fill out an easy questionnaire online. They match you up with a therapist. You, you lock in a time that's convenient for you. Everything is really suited and catered to you as a, just a person who works online. And it's just very, very easy. If for whatever reason your schedule changes, you get a new therapist. It's that easy. And right now, for Locked On NBA listeners, you get a 10% discount off your first month, but only if you visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. That's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash locked on NBA. So if you're thinking about therapy, give BetterHelp a try at betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA. We'll be right back with the rest of the show. We're back here on Locked On NBA. I'm David Ramil with Swipa. Uh, we're finishing up today's uh, show. Uh, remember to always tune in to Locked On NBA to get the best coverage around the league. So many different hosts from around the network always offering their opinions and analysis on everything that's taking place around the league. You won't get that kind of coverage everywhere, anywhere, really, because it's just daily analysis of your team every day from the greatest game recaps to just what's going on with your team. Or if you're a struggling team in the lottery and you're looking forward to the offseason already, they've got you covered with draft analysis you won't find anywhere else. So make sure you follow all the great teams around the network. But uh, a little unfortunate news as uh, earlier this afternoon, we're recording this late uh, well, Tuesday morning at this point, but Monday after evening, I should say, ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski uh, tweeted out that uh, the e, uh, that the NBA had begun uh, an investigation, according to multiple sources, tying Jonte Porter and some potential issues regarding betting. Now, I, to be honest with you, Swipe, I, I'm just still a little unclear about the whole situation. But from what I understand, I don't want to misspeak because obviously there's a player involved. There's other potential family members. This is Jonte Porter, the brother of Michael Porter Jr., who you mentioned earlier. Uh, and so there's a lot to be kind of looked into, a lot of details regarding, and it's still very, very unclear, although we're getting more details almost regularly. Even right now, as we're recording this, Adrian Wojnarowski is still tweeting something out, uh, I guess, latest additions to the whole story as it continues to evolve. But apparently, uh, there were some bets, prop bets, involving porters from games on January 26th and March 20th, and that the league was looking into potential allegations of Porter taking himself out there and then um, in incredible amounts of bets being placed on, on these betting lines that involved Porter. Uh, there was one game in particular where he had to make a, a I guess the, the, the line was set around 5.5 points and he had, he played just four minutes before leaving the game with what the Raptors said was an aggravation of an eye injury that he had suffered from days earlier uh, against the Memphis Grizzlies. And he didn't score against the Clippers in that particular game. And so, again, uh, DraftKings apparently stated that, that there were a number of, uh, of incredible player props. The biggest money winner for betters on any NBA player props from the games that evening involving Porter. So now it looks like he might be tied to it somewhat. What are your overall thoughts on what's going on with Porter right now? Yeah, well, you know, first and foremost, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to his dad uh, a couple of different times and obviously, you know, have met Michael uh, in Denver, uh, you know, obviously – my first thought is them you know they have been dealing with a lot as a family over the last year especially um and i think there's just a lot of stuff that has to happen in order for the story to be fully wrapped up so you know first and foremost is it's just you know on them but i think some of this is is the nba has made this agreement that in order for us to reach the financial ceiling that we would like to reach we have partnered with betting companies and there are many conglomerate businesses that they have decided to work with that the entire the the entire engine is built on player performances 
and guessing the markets on players underperforming or overperforming their expectation. And then even just the the when you look at the line, like when you look in on your on your your bleacher report app or you look on anything, you yeah. look on any platform you have, it's gonna show you the over under for every one of those games. And it's like, oh well, who's out? It's a minus eight point five. They must be missing somebody. Or it just it, whatever else it might be. And the NBA has aligned itself with this thing. And what's interesting is they truly, uh, in their brain and in their decision, they thought that no players would ever, at any point in time, it feels like, truly step over the line and get involved in this directly. And again, I'm not a, I don't know if Jonte did it or not. We're going to find out. But I think right. across the NBA, yeah. this is something that is going to potentially be a problem for an issue for a while. And again, you know, I think a lot of this is you saw what happened Calvin Ridley just a couple years ago in the NFL. You know, right. wasn't even that big of a bet. I mean, it was like fifteen hundred dollars worth of stuff, and got suspended for a whole season. And I think a lot of this is like, you have a bunch of young men that are involved in sport, and it's not even about some money. Sometimes some people just they just do things that are not smart, and they make dumb decisions sometimes because they're still growing, they're still developing all this other stuff. And so I think for the NBA, they have to obviously, which is working, they have checks and balances put in place to make sure that. This is not happening at a high level. But I think this is going to be something that the NBA has to reckon with for years to come because this is the first time the sports has gotten this tied in to betting. And so for it to be this public, to where when you open a game, David, when I open a game, when we're watching television, we're literally hearing from the announcers, you know, from TNT and inside the NBA, hey, well, if you want to get involved today, tap in here. This is where you can place your money. I think that can just create some very problematic issues for the NBA and the NBA players going forward. No, I, I think it's well said. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I love how you pointed out that, you know, I think a lot of people are going to conveniently forget about the humanity involved here. This is a guy who's on a two-way contract. He's not making the kind of crazy NBA money. And I know a lot of people's first reaction is like, oh, what, what's, what's this guy even doing? He's an NBA player. He's a million. That's not how it works out. He's a two-way player struggling just to carve out his identity in the NBA. And this has been his goal, his dream for his whole life. And here there's the realistic possibility. Some people are already tweeting out, you know, or claiming that, you know, th that Adam Silver as the commissioner of the NBA might might have to make a, a strong example of the first player, at least that we know, of, to be potentially involved in something like that. And we should say potential alleged here at this point because nothing mm -hmm. has been finalized. No, no, no clear indication of, of exactly what his ties, if any, might exist. And his NBA career might be over right before it, I mean, it really has even begun. And so it's, it's a shame all around, but as far as the bigger impact here, I, I think you're absolutely right. Like we were hearing stories about JB Bickerstaff, you know, being threatened and receiving these kind of, uh, you know, threats because the Cavaliers lost a game or a player or a, a fan lost a bet, you know, a parlay about something, you know, who knows what it might've been. Uh, and you've got, you know, fans yelling at players on the court, because they didn't get the right minutes or they didn't score enough points or they didn't pull down that extra rebound or whatever it might be. And it's just, it's really, as you said, problematic having to separate, you know, the, 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 the game that we all love at, with the, the fact that now it's tied to personal income and we're associated. It's not just fandom anymore, which already was problematic in many ways, because mm -hmm. obviously some fans go extremely over top, but now you're tied your, your whole financial resources as a person to the outcome of these players. And, and, you know, that's really, really frightening to consider. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, this is all just breaking even as we're talking about it right now. But it does feel like there's going to be some bigger issue. Uh, if not Porter, some other player down the road is probably likely to get caught because that's just the nature of humanity, unfortunately. But the way I – my immediate reaction upon hearing it was it's going to have a bigger picture impact on the league in general, kind of similar to – you know, I don't know how old you are. If you remember it clearly, the palace at the the, the malice at the palace, yeah. and the kind of shift in the way that fans viewed the league and the way that the the the, the, you know, the league office had to kind of correct the behavior of players to kind of change and make them a little bit more palatable for fans and things of that mm -hmm. sort. It didn't work. Obviously, it was ridiculously misguided, in my opinion. But I, I just feel like it, it could be a, a turning point in how the the relationship between fans the league office and players all evolves. It, it just seems like this is a watershed moment here. So I'm curious to see how it all plays out. Well, you heard Tyrese Halliburton. Any, uh, the any other day. Final... You heard no, Tyrese I did not. Halliburton what did he say about this? 
Well, he said, like, you know, people look at me like a prop, like I'm like I'm just uh yeah. just something that makes them money instead of like a person yeah. as you're talking about. Like, yeah. you know, these are people, they have families, they have dreams outside of basketball, yeah, yeah. they have interests outside of basketball. Like, I'm here for a service, I provide entertainment, but at the end of the day, like this is my life. And so I think as you're saying, players and coaches being approached by individual people that could be pressuring them. And again, I, I don't want to they, I don't want to tap too far into this because me and you could get into Jordan in the 90s and how deep he got into some of the stuff that he was in and who was pushing him on yeah. the outside to make some decisions yeah. with his yeah. own game. So this is what I'm saying. This is not yeah. like a small thing. We're talking about there are there are certain communities that developed entire industries off of betting and off of gambling. And they have a very large interest in how players are performing. So this is what I'm saying. This is I'm just saying this this could get dangerous in terms of the outcome and out for for other people. And so for me, it's just like I just want the NBA to realize that if you are this is not these aren't machines. These are people. And so yes. I think if we can do away with this and, and go back, then, you know, we, we're never going to happen. But then I would rather us be in a situation where players are not put in compromised situations because they have a way a means to be like, look, I can make an additional 50 G on the side by doing yeah. this, 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 and this, like that's, that's a lot of pressure. And why would you even put a 20 year old or a 21 year old in a situation have to think through that? Yeah. Yeah, I know that's well said. I mean, it, what he did was if he did in fact do it relatively benign and yet again, uh, you know, it could cost him a lot more in, a certain, in terms of his NBA career uh, and and I, I, you know, something to always keep in mind whenever you think of players, it's always to remember their humanity and to empathize with what they're going through, to kind of just distance the idea of, well, they're making this money and that's what they signed up for. I'm uh, always going to be a pro player guy, first and foremost. The league tries to do what they can, but the league's not going anywhere. They're a good organization, a well-run organization that's been around for quite some time. But it's the players that just that we kind of chew up and spit out all too casually for my taste. So. I hope it works out. I hope there's some clarification on this, and I hope in the long term that there could be some resolution and some way of finding a comfortable balance between people having fun, being able to place bets on the game that they love, and at the same time still be respectful of the humanity factor involved. But that'll do it for today's episode of Locked On NBA. Remember that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. I'm David Ramil. That's Swipa. We're wrapping up today's show. Have a great rest of your week, and make sure to catch the rest of the great daily coverage of the NBA right here on Locked On NBA.